like to open up to questions. I know there's been a lot of things going on. Um, you guys have been in the lot the past two or three days. We don't talk about the, uh, the fire escape as, as a deck. Um, and, you know, we did look into that, and it truly is a policing matter because that fire escape is a fire escape. It's clear and simple. The last platform that uh, the, I guess, children misused, uh, they had no right to be there. Um, they, they were blocking a means of egress, so that would be the violation. Um, as always, if you hear or see things like that, please call me directly. I left, directly. I left my business card here. Um, it actually has my cell phone number on it. Call me and, and we'll take care of things uh, as quickly as we can. But we, we did get on that. Um, the council did a really good job reporting that. And it got the right kind of attention and obviously the right kind of response. Commissioner, can I just ask a question sure. about that? Um, thanks to Matt Conti, mm -hmm. who runs MarkMWaterfront.com, and reported this issue and had many, many comments, actually the uh, son of the owner of the property in question wrote in and said that he had been assured by uh, ISD that the use of people going out there onto that was a proper use. Um, do you have any idea why he would say that? He said that because he wasn't contacted by the fire department until after the house comments. Uh, I would say that straight. he said that in absolute peril. Yes. There was nobody from ISD that gave the permission to use a fire escape. Um, everybody does it. We know it. We know it's always night. Um, and the people that have been using it have been a little more respectful to the community and, and to the garden. It may not have been the issue that it turned into, but they obviously um, did respect that. So we're really glad to see that you know, things step right up. Uh, they took care of it, and uh, it's something that I think we want to the future very closely. If you see them out there, call me. I dispatch inspectors 24-7. Yes. What was your response to the young lady from the we finished with the fire safety, but I do want to talk about that. Um, the, uh, the, the poor girl that got hurt um, didn't live in the building, so technically uh, trespassing. Chimneys are not designed to perform exhaustion. Uh, I got interviewed about that, and I think it's you know, one, simple common sense. Uh, two, it's illegal. You know, the deck is not a public recreational area. If decks are uh, to be public areas, there are real laws and guidelines around that. Um, I know she got hurt. I don't know what her condition is right now. But uh, there, there were two bodies sitting in it, and the weight of it, you know, the chimney was old, uh, and it caused a point load on it. I can give you the physics on what happened. But technically, you know, it's, it's like that clothesline that you overload, that pulls the pole down. That's exactly what happened. Uh, so she did get hit. If you have a guest at your house and uh, they don't live there, uh, they're technically trespassing? Technically, yes. She crossed over from another room. And, you know, the, the roof access is, uh, its primary use is for the maintenance of the roof. Uh, in those rare cases, it is used as a fire escape. And in the event there's a fire below a level and somebody's got to be extracted from the roof of the building, that's why it's done that way. But it's not meant for recreational use at all. And if, if someone has a roof deck that you're concerned about, um, give us a call. We can determine you know, whether they have permits to do it or not. And if they don't, then we can stop them from, from using it and, and bring them to ISD under violations. Could you clarify that? If if a rooftop isn't specifically permitted for the roof deck, then it's illegal for people to be on the roof. Is that what you're saying? The, using it as a uh, uh, area of recreation. It's used for maintenance. Is the roof deck being It absolutely does. It absolutely does. And what's the process for that? Just so that we have Well, it depends. Uh, every zoning district has different requirements. But essentially, what it means is if, if it's a common roof deck in a new building today, you have to have two means of egress and an elevator access, right? If it's a private deck that's specific to one unit, all it needs is one means of egress to go up. 
Uh, there has to be railings on all sides. They have to be 42 inches in height. And there can be no opening wider than four inches. So it's, it's all designed around safety. Um, I drive around the city a lot, as you can imagine, uh, and I'm always terrified when I go by these beautiful roof decks that all of a sudden they look and there's a tree planted there, or there's a gazebo that has been built up and over it. Um, if those things aren't factored into the structure of the roof, that's a very dangerous situation. So we try to stay on top of it. Um, there are a lot more people doing it than people who can prevent it. So, you know, I really do rely on, on the partnership that you guys have always shared with us because I get, our, I get the phone calls and you respond as quickly as we possibly can. But if you have a question, please call us. Because the only way that I can be very effective to this neighborhood as well as the other neighborhoods in the city is for us to dispatch people to real things. Sometimes people will call us and they'll ask, you know, there's, there's an illegal roof deck. Like that. the first report that came in about the fire escape was they had built an illegal roof deck. So the first thing we did was look at our records. There was never a permit for a roof deck. Right? So we immediately sent out uh, Brian Rohn, one of our senior inspectors, was out that night. Uh, and, you know, he called me right back and he said, no, it's the extension of the fire escape. So sometimes we can handle it administratively because we can tell you what's on file and what's legal and what's not legal. And when it's not legal, then we come up. Now, you know, it's an old city. There are a lot of things that were built long before permit. So we will come out and it's, it's a term that I hate. It's called grandfather clause. The technical term for it is the continuation of a non-conforming use. Right? Grandfather is so much easier to remember. Um, and in a lot of those cases, these elements are legal because they were there before the zoning existed. If somebody modifies their building to a substantial point, right, and what it is is if they renovate more than 50% of the floor area, they have to bring these things up to code. So that's where we're able sometimes, because I mean, as you all know, everybody wants to live in the North End. Everybody. And so uh, the buildings that are happening, the way that they're happening, we're seeing a lot of old buildings really renovated. From where I sit, I love it because the life safety issues are brought up to a whole new level. From where you sit, you hate it because of what it does to our neighborhoods. So Mayor Walsh is, is very aware of this. We're, we're looking at zoning. Um, Mayor Walsh, in, in the budget this year, we're very happy to say We've got five new building inspectors, and that's the first time I think in 15 or 18 years that building inspectors were added. The mayor understands, you know, the importance of, of being out there, being up front. And as I told you before, when I came last year was that, you know, we're using technology in a way that's very different now. Um, for the first two years of uh, Mayor Walsh's administration, we were collecting information on things. Now we're using that data to really deploy people. Um, the, one of the most successful programs we have is the rental registry program. And for the first time, we're really getting an understanding of how many rental units there are in the city of Boston and where they are. And we're looking to modify their uh, registry program even more so that we can learn more about the character, like the number of bedrooms, the number of occupants. And so we've got a lot of uh, ordinances and zoning regulations that is now being vetted out by the city and primarily by the legal department to, so that we can enact some of these to gather more information. But it's important to know if you own rental property, you've got to register by July 1st. If there are less than six units and it's owner-occupied, you pay the reg registration fee, you don't have to do the inspection. Over six units, every uh, unit has to be inspected at least once every five years. And there are all kinds of legal hurdles that go along with that because when our inspectors come to your door, even though we said, look, we're going to be at your house Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we show up Wednesday at 3 o'clock and we say, you know what? I don't want you in here. And you close the door. You have every legal right to do that. It does become a violation. It's called a violation of entry. Um, we try very hard not to pursue those in court ridiculous for all of us. What we prefer to do is try to work with you to let you understand that ISD's mission is to help you not to come in and write violations. I hate writing violations because that doesn't always solve the problem. I'd much prefer to work with you 
to solve the problem. Yes. And more times than not, we can actually do that. And we're, we're experiencing really great success. We have a lot of people coming in uh, to IST, either you know, electronically or uh, physically coming into the building, to talk to us about what they've got. Um, you know, thinking about doing this. What codes does it trip if I do this? And we're only too happy to sit down and, and really you know, talk it through what the process is. Because the more you know, the less likely you are to have a problem. It just makes the whole process easy. Mayor Walsh <coughs> excuse me, has also mandated that if you call my office, you better get a phone call back in 24 hours. Now, you may not get the answer to the question you're calling, but you're going to get the name of a person that got the message, what their telephone number is, so there's an exchange then to follow up. And that's separate from 311. Uh, that's, you know, in the office directly. If somebody doesn't call, usually within 48 hours it ends up on my desk. So I have to make two phone calls. One to you to find out what your question is, and the other to the person who did return your phone call to find out why they didn't return your phone call. Um, 311, please use it. Um, if you have smartphones, all you gotta do is take a picture, send it into us. It's all geocoded and time stamped, so we know what it is. If you want to get a response, you have to give us some information, email address or some contact. We will give you an incident number. It's, I don't know, it's like a 10 digit number or something, but it gets emailed to you so you don't have to remember it. And you can follow up on what happened and what didn't happen. Any other general questions? Yes. I'm interested to know about interior building permits for innovations, mm -hmm. what the requirements are, and what happens if someone did work and didn't have a building permit. Okay. There are, uh, there are four categories of, of building permits. There is a category that uh, does not require a building permit. You're putting carpet down. You're refinishing your floors. Um, doing kitchen cabinets, not the sink and the gas, but the cabinets. Things like that you don't need a permit. We have a program of it's called the short form permit. So that if you're not affecting the occupancy, the egress, or the structure of the building, it's a very quick way to get a permit. Then there's the long form permit. Depending upon what you do, you have to come in and give us a description of what you're doing. If you're affecting the structure of the building, you have to you know, get the uh, services of a structural engineer or an architect to make sure what you're doing is safe. And that's primarily what our concern is, is to make sure that things are safe. So the, the answer that I always say is, the 90% of the questions people ask me is, it depends. You've got to give me a little more information so that I can really qualify. The building code, we are, uh, as of July 1st, we're the ninth edition of the, of the uh, building code. The ICC is in place. So for the next six months, you can either use the eighth edition or the ninth edition. If you like reading manuals, it's the greatest thing in the world to do. I like reading manuals. Uh, but the code is changing. And there are all kinds of nuances that trigger different things. Um, you're be rebuilding, you're putting new steps on your front stairs. That's maintenance. That's fine. You're rebuilding the framing that holds up those stairs. That's structural. And we want to know about it. You're changing the occupancy of a building um, to go from, I don't know, a two bedroom and a store or two units in a store to three units. You gotta commit, because you gotta make sure that the occupancy requirements are different. Um, you build a building that's over 70 feet high. It's considered a high rise. There's a whole different set of fire code requirements that go along with that. So there's never a simple answer. But if you come in and talk to us with enough detail, we can walk you through exactly what it is. The, ICC has uh, 13 different volumes. Um, everything from installing solar panels to residential construction, commercial construction, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, um, piles, uh, environment. I don't look at them all because they're just too many. Well, if I give you more specifics, if you look at a building where two or more units have had significant plumbing and electrical work is unpermitted, what's the recourse, right? Oh yes, there's a real recourse. That, that's, that's a real violation. 
Plumbing and electrical are, are two things, particularly electrical, electrical causes fires. Uh, the uh, electrical code was updated, the last major update was around 76, 78, um, and that made a big change in the safety of building. We actually saw a huge drop in fires because of it. But if they're affecting any of those systems, they have to file for a permit. And that's separate than a building permit. You, get a, you file a building permit for the general work that's going on around it, but then you have to go to our electrical department to get a permit from them to do the work. If somebody is doing that, then you have to let us know. We have, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing, and it's an old trick contract is always used. The committee get a permit to like reshingle a section of the house. They put the building permit in the window. It's got to be in the window. If you go buy a house that's doing work and you don't see a permit, call us. That's a violation. But more importantly, read what the permit is for. Um, Monday night, this is a true story, Monday night, 9 o'clock, I was very comfortable on my couch, and I got a phone call that a contractor had fallen out a window. 9 o'clock at night. It's illegal to work after 6 o'clock without a special permit. The North End, the South End, and South Boston can only be given permits by me. Those people have to come to me and ask for a permit. I will let an extended hours permit go if it's in the public interest. You know, they're putting up a crane. It screws up traffic terribly. Prefer to see them do that on a Saturday than Monday morning going to work. They have, I don't know, an HVAC piece of equipment coming up from Tennessee. And it shows up here on a Saturday. And they got to pick it up and put it to place. I'll give them a permit for that. If the building is open and there's bad weather coming, I will allow them to make the building weather tight for stuff like that. When they come in and ask me, then they never ask, me. it's kind of the way they tell you, I need this because I'm behind schedule. Too bad. That's not our issue. If you poorly scheduled it, then you poorly scheduled it. What I will do is I go to neighborhood services uh, on a permit that I'm concerned about. Or if it's something that I'd like to do and I want to make sure that this person has been okay. I live in Savin Hill and there's a project that's been going on for 18 months and they have taken the parking on two corners. Right? Enough. You had your time. Get those construction signs off there and I pulled their parking permits. I don't issue the parking and the sidewalk permits, but I do have influence with the traffic department when I call and tell them that. So if there's a contractor that's been a bad neighbor or working until 8 o'clock at night every night of the week without permits and then comes into us and you know gives me a, a story that I kind of believe but I'm not sure of, I make a phone call. He says, is this guy been good to our neighborhood? Is he doing what he said he was going to do? and we'll, we'll, we'll stop those permits. But my original story about this call the other night at 9 o'clock, um, I went to the site, and sure enough, there's a building permit in the window. I'm happy. And I noticed they had building three decks in the front of the house. I walk around the back, three new decks in the back of the house. The first and second floors were total renovations. You know what the permit was for? Reshingling the first floor deck. Now this was terrible because a man fell off the deck and he did fracture his skull. Right? So those are the people that I go after. I'm going after this contractor's license because I think it was irresponsible. Had they come in with a reason that they had to do this, we would sit down and work with them. So if you see a contractor that's working Saturday, Sunday, or a Boston holiday, Ask them, do they have a 24-hour or an after-hours permit? And if they are rude to you or don't give you an answer, call me. I'll have an inspector there within an hour, and we'll shut them down. Now, I've been getting a lot of calls from people in, in the South End, particularly right now. They say, you know, we still have these contractors that are repeat offenders. They'll not ask for a permit on a Saturday, and they'll stop working. And what they're asking me to do, and we're going to look into it, I don't think I can do it, but I'm going to look into it, is that more than just shutting them down, 
they want me to penalize them three days. The real person inside me loves that idea because they'll do it once. But then we gotta think about the whole economics of our city and the impact on neighborhoods because if I shut them down for three days, all it's gonna do is make the project go longer and have more of an effect on you. So it's always a, a balancing thing. You know, I, I, on Friday I'm handed a list of who's got weekend permits because, you know, aside from the three days, as I told you, there are other permits given up. There are areas in the city that I pretty liberally give Saturday permits. Downtown Boston, the Seaport, areas of major development. I know that if I give them weekend permits for a month, I've shot that project by 10 days almost because it's very expensive to start and stop projects and things like that. So when we shut somebody down on a Saturday, there is a penalty. It's a real penalty. They've hired that team to work that day. And if we show up at, you know, 10 o'clock, say, shut it down. Those people are still being paid. So the person making this judgment call is paying a penalty. It's not as much as I'd like it because they keep doing it. And some of them consider it the cost of doing business. You know? So if it's repeated, I do have the authority to pull their permit. Uh, and I, you know, Kim, she's the assistant commissioner playing zoning out, but she was former legal counsel. But I always tell me, be careful doing what you're doing with this stuff. But my attitude about some of this stuff, I prefer to do it, stop it, make a precedent. I usually end up getting sued. But that's all right. That's the cost of us doing business to make sure that a lot of these contractors and developers understand they're in a neighborhood and they've got to respect the neighborhood. It's the one ordinance that I don't have. It's good behavior. But I do talk to contractors, and I talk to them a lot. Uh, the power of the bully pulpit, which is you know, one of my strongest things, a lot of people don't want me mad at them. Not that it really means anything, because I try to be as fair as I possibly can. But the people that are riding the edge, they always try to you know, do right, and usually I say, hey, look, you know, if I know the name of your company, it's usually not a good thing. So we try very hard to do it. We're successful, I'd say 75, maybe 80% of the time. Just, there are still those ones that get through and cause a nuisance for you for a weekend and stuff like that. But the more you tell us, the more we can be responsive and, and try to get back to it. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, related question. Um, when when uh, an owner of a building applies for a permit to do some kind of renovation or construction, is there any consideration given to how many times they have done construction on that building? I'm asking because I know there's people in the neighborhood that have been bothered multiple times over the last few years by renovations for the same building where their section of the street is continually used as a Not, not really. There really isn't. There is certain um, things like the cumulative amount of work you do in a three-year period is considered one project. So some contractors will come in, they'll say, I'm going to renovate the first floor this year. So I'm under that 50% threshold, so I'm not tripping those other codes. And the second year they come out, they say, well, we're going to do the second floor this year. Still under the threshold, because as far as they see, they think we understand they're only doing one unit. But we keep track of this. So if they do that amount of work in, in a three-year period, then they get hit with these other several things. Um, one thing that you've got to be clear about, there's no mandate how long it takes to do a project. People ask us this all the time. He's been working on that for 18 months. You know, if I were doing it, I could have had that done in nine months. Well, you had 10 years. 10 years, well, that's pretty excessive. Um, it is. I could, we could look at more of that. There are periods of abandonment if they're not doing things. Um, but when a contractor comes in, we always ask them, how long do you think it's going to take? And construction, as much of a science as it is, it really isn't. There are so many things that can happen, particularly in renovation. Renovation is the hottest thing to predict because you can't see through walls. Open up a wall and find out the condition that you thought it was is, is, is not the condition. Um, so we try to encourage them. But there is no penalty for something taking a real long time. If 
the contractor is taking 10 years but maintains a safe site. There's nothing I can do. Not, you know, by the current statute. It's just, they have that right. If they don't take care of the property, that's a different thing. Then I can, I can step up. Yeah. You said that it's not an after hours permit for work has to cease at 6 p.m., correct? Yes. What time are they allowed to start work? Seven. That's what so, seven, 7 a.m. to 6 a.m. is the standard working period. You know, and when when people come to me, they want to work on a Saturday. Like outside of here. No, you can't start at 7 a.m. Oh, I'm just painting. I said, all right, so your guys, when they come up, are going to very quietly close the door. They're not going to stand outside and have that cup of coffee and talk about the baseball game last night. So I'll tell them, you know, you got to paint fine. You can start at 9 o'clock. You can start at 10 o'clock. You know, but I really try to hold Sunday as a day of rest. Not a religious overtone, but just at least one day a week should be totally the citizens. And, you know, if you want to sleep late or you just want to get up and not hear, you know, construction of trucks pounding more than what's usual in the neighborhood, then we try to respect that. Uh-oh. Uh no. <laughs> I have to ask Mary, do we have time to talk about 16 to 18 months? <laughs> well, I guess we could, if the commissioner would mind to ask uh, <coughs> some questions about that. One thing that's been a concern is that it seems as though in this neighborhood lately there have been a number of projects that are presented to us as things that are being built as of right and not requiring the variance as much before the understanding was always that they didn't require a variance. And there has been a lot of concern about the particular project that we I'll answer that question then I'm going to ask him to talk about the question. Sure. Um, the rules haven't changed. So, and I've heard this from other people that um, it seems like it's different now than, than it was. It's not. The only one who could determine that a project is as of right or requires variances is IST. The BPEA or the BRA can't do it. DAD can't do it. Or the worst. We're the only ones who can certify it. The uh, plants examiners that are all working in the King Shop, um, they're blind to what's going on outside of the river. They have a set of regulations by which they judge every single project. And if there's a violation, you know, it says there's going to be a four foot setback. And it's three feet, 11 and a half inches. It's not a four foot setback. We have no ability to say, well, you know, just measure it away. So that becomes a violation. If it says it's got to be 40 feet high, there are definitions of what that height is to. In most cases, it's to the roof structure, not the parapet. And so it may appear that something is a violation, but in reality, it's not. <coughs> Again, if you see something, you know, and we've had a lot of discussion about moisture, um, that's what I think is well versed to talk about it. Um, call us, and, and we can explain it to you. Sometimes the nuances of the zoning are, are really kind of weird. We just uh, rewrote the zoning in South Boston, which is the first time there's been a major overhaul of zoning. And within the first three months, we got so much pushback and questions and everything that a new overlay district just went over the whole new zoning. That will give us a year to work out some of these things. When you write zoning, you cannot figure every possible question. You just can't. It's, uh, it's like analyzing the, uh, a set of drawings against the building code. You can do, do it hypothetically, but when you get a real building and you're comparing it to the building code, some really weird nuances come out. Um, one of the things that came out of the South Boston zoning is um, the residents said to me, we don't want any more big buildings. It's okay. Stop selling your houses. And, and I'm not being a smart ass. Alec, um, it's, it's the truth, because we cannot prevent people from amassing property, following the zoning, in a building that's bigger than what it is. Unless you're in a historic or an overlay district, there are no restrictions on that. Now what we've done in South Boston is, this overlay district, if you build four or more units, you go into the board of peace. 
And this isn't to stop development or to say the zoning that we wrote was bad. It's giving us a chance to really test the zoning, to see how it works, where are our assumptions correct. You know, was, was the wording in zoning? Have you ever read zoning? Oh my God, the lawyers that know, I apologize. Why can't they say simple things? Uh, more than three units. Why can't they say four or more? And then there's a whole question about decimals if you round up and round down. Why? Did you say, you know, two bedrooms, two parking spaces. I, I love the one. Um, 1 1.5 parking spaces per unit. <laughs> what does that mean? And when I do the math, I don't like that math. Because it does give larger projects an advantage. If I'm building 30 units, it's a lot different than if I'm building three. And when you do them by you know 1.5, you actually get to build less parking spaces. And that's a philosophical thing, but I mean, my job is to uh, make sure that the zoning as written, we are part of the discussion on zoning, um, is followed and followed the letter consistently. And so if there are questions or concerns, we will always explain to you what our logic was to get to where we go. There is a thing called the citizen's appeal. If the Board of Appeals makes a decision you don't agree with, you can appeal it. It goes to Board Final Arbiter, which is a little different than the regular the Zoning Board of Appeals, but you can challenge their decision. If I issue a building permit and you think I'm wrong, there you got to sue me. But you have the opportunity to do that. And it's done to me all the time. I don't take it personal. Uh, some people read numbers differently than others. We have a project going on now that the architect has certified that the building is exactly 40 feet. One of the abutters doesn't agree. So he came to me and said, what do I do? And I said, you've got to get another professional to challenge those numbers. So two days later, he brings in a professional. He says, you're going to challenge this. And he says, yes, I am. I said, all right, now you've got a professional licensed person challenging another professional licensed person. Whatever the result of that's going to be is going to be determined by a court of law. And then whoever was wrong is getting sued by the other guy. <laughs> Defame their character. You know? So it's it's a very, very complicated process. I happen to love it. The people that, that I that work with us really do enjoy it. Um, you know it's, it's not, I always tell people, and I've said, said it here before, when I tell you something, you may not like the answer you're going to hear, but it's the truth. Uh, and, I, and, and I stand by it. So, uh, and I'm not afraid to be challenged. I never take it personally. Uh, I'm an architect. I've been an architect for 35 years now. So I think I've seen an awful lot of things. Um, I, I haven't yet said that I've seen it all because. Once a week, something comes into my desk that I just can't believe. Um, but we look at it as challenges. Um, we try to develop a really good history of how we make decisions so that we can be consistent. Another thing before it comes to no zoning decision is precedent setting. And that's a very, very important thing to think about. I go and I want to build a house, and the Board of Appeals says I can build my house right up to the side. You own the house next door. Just because I got a variance does not guarantee you a variance. So when a developer comes to you and says, well, this is being done all over the North End, that has zero weight to the Board of Appeals. Because they look at every single project differently on the merits of the project. You want to hear about Moon Street? Yes. You want to ask I'd like to ask a question about Moon Street. Oh, can I ask the question first and then? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I have had the opportunity to look at the plans with children people. Uh, as I recall, as we talked about a month ago, the Cornish line is However, there is a mechanical room, there is an elevator mechanical room on the roof 
unfortunately is not a space. Uh, let me read something from the zoning code and ask you, does that mean that the mechanical room can be up to 70 feet high? It looks as though there is no height limit for a mechanical room, in which case it's a loophole that needs to be closed. So let me read it. Roof structures, head houses, and mechanical equipment normally built above the roof and not designed or used for human occupancy shall be included in measuring the building. If total area of such roof structures, head houses, and mechanical equipment exceeds in the aggregate 330 square feet if the total roof area of the building is 3,300 square feet or less. As I recall the plan, it was something like 24% of the roof, so it doesn't violate that provision. Therefore, does that mean that the mechanical room can be 70 feet high? Well, technically speaking, so one, one issue with the height, um, I know that when you're, you're looking at the actual height from the front elevation to the rear elevation, it looks like it's two different heights, and it's because of the way it slides from the front to the rear. So whenever that's happening, there's different calculation, and rather than Right. Those were average right. stuff. Exactly. So can you answer them? Yes. So the height, is there a height limit for a mechanical room, or is there no height? What do you mean? You don't think it's clear as a fellow in the summit? <laughs> well, it seems so to me, in which case would you agree that there's a loophole, and would you tell us how we close it, how we get the zoning oh, to me close it? Will you, support, <laughs> will you support closure of the loophole? Um, well, that's a bigger policy question in, in terms of what we look at. Technically, yes. So long as whatever plan is presented to us, and so long as you meet all of the requirements within the code, then yes, you would be compliant. No, I got to answer. Well, well, was the, get policy the answer is absolutely yes, but you have to justify it. You can't just arbitrarily decide to put a, a roof, uh, an elevator, a house that goes up 22 feet. There's no requirement. The elevator, elevator has to come at least three foot four above the line of the roof for the, uh, the carrying piece, right? So if the answer to your question, and it's so hypothetical, and it's volatile, 70 feet is an arbitrary number, the answer is those pieces. Let's say uh, 55 plus <laughs> eight. Let's say 63. It doesn't matter what it is. The, the way it works is those spaces that are not designed human use are not considered in the height of the building unless they exceed the 330 square feet of 30 percent of the building. The answer to you is yes. But they have to justify to us what it is. You can buy an HVAC unit that's 14 feet high. You can also buy an HVAC 14 feet high by 8 feet wide. You can also buy one that's 8 feet high by 14 feet long. So we look at those kinds of things. We also look at the placement of where they go. We don't want them on the edge of the building. We want them in the middle of the building. We can. Sometimes we can't do that because of the way that the nature of the floor plan and how the circulation and egress works. But the answer to your question is yes. I call it a loophole. Okay. Uh, second and final question. Is there no limit to the height of the parapet? No, so no, there isn't. There isn't. Sure. Because this plan also shows <laughs> the extension of the wall on the north side, on the, on the Fleet Street side, mm -hmm. going up to the height of the mechanical roof, which is 8 feet or so, um, yeah. which protects the roof deck on the side very nicely. A person can sit there and not be seen by the It also table. visually blocks the roof. But it blocks, yeah. Yeah, it's, part of the it's called a parapet, but I thought a parapet was a low. Yeah, the other part of it too is if you're going to build a parapet, you're going to have a reason because parapets are very expensive to build. Just the pure physics of a parapet, it's like a diving board. It's got no lateral strength, so you've got to build strength inside that wall in order for it to pass on a structural basis. So if you're doing it, you're doing it for a reason. We will encourage parapets to be a little higher. It's going to hide an HVAC uh, unit or things like that. Um, <clears throat> I don't consider it as much a loophole because that's part of the analysis that has to be done. If we went and said, 
the apparent it can only be three foot high. And there was some reason for it to be four foot high. Then it becomes a board of appeal situation. It becomes something that's long and drawn out. Um, okay, thanks. Questions answered. To move forward. Disagree. I'm going to sue you if you don't come back every year. No, please. <laughs> you don't need to sue me to come back every year. Just invite me. I'll come back all the time. I'd like to thank Commissioner.